Okay. So, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I want to call out, because we do have some people in the room with us. Uh, we have, obviously, David Diaz, who's on our board. We have Kim Woodruff, who's on our board. We have uh, uh, a respected board member who will be here. We have Dan Traveler, who's on our steering committee. And uh, we want to thank everybody for coming out here today. And we'll probably have more people as everybody files in from the avenue, so that's good too. Um, our guest speaker tonight, oh, and we have Nancy Keck from the Borough President's Office, who's a city officer, so hey Nancy. Um, and the Borough President is on her way, so we are going to start our agenda uh, until she gets here, and then when she gets here, we're gonna put her right on to answer all your questions. I appreciate everyone, either through Instagram, or email, or in the case of one of you, frantic text messaging me, got your questions as a part of this. And if you are watching us on Facebook, if you want to post your questions to the Borough President now, we will take those towards the end of our in-person discussion, and we will try to incorporate them as best we can. So um, we're going to go right to community items, because that's what we're here to do as a community-based organization. Uh, so the good news is that we, uh, if this Monday, Oh, and David Ellis, who gave us our space here while I'm standing in front of <laughs> Everyone suggested we come to this space, and here we are, and I understand why they suggested that, but they do a beautiful view of the center of City Island. Um, so we're going to go right to good news, and that's that as of this Monday, uh, if you are on the Board of Elections portal, you can sign up for UPK on City Island. Yes. Oh, which is a good, which is a good move. We still need to fix some things at the site, but everybody's talking, so we're gonna hope we're gonna get UPK here for the fall semester. And for all the moms who are watching, who ask me about this consistently, I mean, we are—it's an everyday thing, as everyone here knows. But we are on it. There is a C of O change, which is a certificate of occupancy that needs to be altered to post UPK and some minor renovations. And Maria has been very helpful as well. And uh, we're working on it, and it has not always been easy. Yes. <laughs> but we are working. Understatement. Understatement. And uh, what I do is I take everything from the old agenda and I move it over to the new agenda with an update. So, unfortunately, just like the last meeting where we went from something really happy to kind of said, um, that, but this is beautiful in a sense because we're going to be memorializing the life of Elizabeth Mass. As many of you know, she was a construction worker who lost her life due to an incident of gun violence and a person who was possibly suffering from some sort of health issue. Um, we are going to do it April 30th at 2 p.m. at Bridge Park. Uh, there's going to be poets there. There are going to be members of the clergy there. Uh, and her daughter is going to be joining us. She's been a part of the, uh, of the planning of this event. It's going to be uh, kind of uh, interdenominational and interreligious, so we're going to try to have someone there from different religious denominations. And uh, if anyone goes by, if you notice, on the bench it does read Elizabeth Mass, the mayor of City Island. It's her union, because she was very involved in her union on the one side, and then three initials, and the initials are her children's names. This is what they, they chose the black. So we gave that to them, and we are looking forward to, uh, we are definitely looking forward to uh, you know, kind of paying our respects to her, and you know, she touched many people's lives during her time here. Uh, third third uh, thing that's ha happening, if you will, in the neighborhood, is there was a Heart Island meeting. This was done, if any of you remember, there is a part of the legislation that passed for Heart Island required a transportation study. So there have been two meetings with an outside firm. I know we've been in those meetings. Uh, they've been interesting. Uh, they've also been with family members who have uh, their loved ones in turn there. So that's been very interesting. Where is that noise coming from? Hey, there's some video playing in the background. Uh, hold on one second. Does this adjust up? Yeah. There we go. Just, uh, there we go. You can, you can hear the video still. Okay, just, um, there we go. <laughs> okay, this should be that. Sorry for whoever. Uh, no, knowing me, it's probably PBS NewsHour or Pod Save America. So uh, if, you, if you're going to complain that we're liberally indoctrinating someone on this one, it was purely my uh, ignorance. Um, so we have also, uh, with the Heart Island meeting, one of the interesting things that came out of it was, and I put the quotes in here, existing infrastructure at Fordham Street is incompatible with NYC ferry vessels. So look, this is a first good sign. I know some people have felt that if we did get a ferry, it would have to leave from Fordham Street. We've never been, you know, uh, 
directed it towards a particular stop. They could rebuild Belden Point Pier. It may be somewhere else. We just want them to look at it. Uh, but you know, just because the infrastructure, the existing infrastructure, isn't good enough, I, which I, I think we all would agree with, you know, there is a, a part of the uh, federal infrastructure bill. There's over 180 billion dollars to increase ferry expansion in places that have existing ferries. So if the funding is there, that could always change. And uh, there were some concerns with parking yeah. in that area, so we will try to address those. Uh, everyone knows the. The uh, Fenton Marina and some of those areas are actually, uh, they are actually, what is the right term? It is for lease right now, so we've had some preliminary conversations with them, but we've been taking all the good input people have given, and for those who uh, have their, you know, want to go visit Hart Island, it's about to become a lot more open, and they're actually going to have a bus or jitney that's going, it's going to be similar to what they have at the Thrives Night Ferry, where the bus is going to probably stop at either Pelham Bay Park, I'm sorry, at, at Pelham Bay Station, or Orchard Beach, or both, both, and then loop and go right on to the ferry itself. But for those who want to drive out here, a majority of people do drive based on what uh, the survey indicated. They will be able to uh, drive right to the ferry and get on as they always have. So if anything, this is good because one, it opens things up, and two, if someone does want to visit, they're going to have more transportation options to get to Hart Island, which is also very good. And they're examining uh, connecting it uh, via ferry to other points, which raises the incredible ironic point, as Michael here has pointed out, that Hart Island might get a ferry before City Island, <laughs> but we are, we are still working on both. The irony there is not uh, lost on me. Um, we've also been attending a few other meetings that have been going on in the neighborhood, uh, one of which was at PS75, so David, why don't you update us? Uh, no, I just had the opportunity to represent Ryzen at PS 175's first uh, uh, climate justice um, teaching. I was uh, joined by some of our esteemed colleagues here as well, Nancy Patrick and Walter Tom as well. Um, it, was, it was great. It was a great experience to meet. We met with you know sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, they had a breakout rooms, and each in, in each each of the rooms, they were we talked about different different things, right? My my panel was about you know climate justice. Um, it was great just to get the kids, you know, started to have these conversations about you know climate. We do live on an island, right? So um, I, you know, it was just nice. It was just nice to be there. Absolutely. Yep. Can I just add something? Yes, please. Yeah, this was. Um, in conjunction with what, what was called the Worldwide Teach-In. And uh, most of the other 300 participants were universities and <coughs> colleges around the world. We happened to bring it to the attention to PS175. They did encourage K-12 participation. I don't know how much they got, but City Island PS175 was part of the Worldwide Teach-In. Yes. It was fantastic. Yes. We have an incredible school that's going to really Pay attention to climate issues. So, and, and I'm uh, speaking to that because I know John. I don't know what, what's the organization also that have been reaching out. Oh, so uh, the Waterfront Alliance, of which Rising is a member of, has reached out to us. Uh, David, Beverly, Kim, myself. We're going to have a sit down. They want to do some uh, children's programming over the summer. Here. Right. So, so I, spoke with, you well. I spoke with with Miss um, Corus and, and and some of them made that connection and, and, and make that happen for the summer. So the kids are be able to yeah. explore the waterfront, you know, kind of uh, realize how tied it is to not just our local environment, but everything else. And there's going to be a strong emphasis from our conversations on climate change, sea level rising, our carbon footprint, and everything else. Uh, on that same vein, I'm going to segue. We, we, uh, uh, the NY Climate Council had their first meeting in the Bronx. It was very interesting. Uh, just so everyone knows, when they passed climate legislation back in 2019. Part of it is they set up this council, which is supposed to basically, uh, you know, lo lower our uh, our carbon footprint. It's supposed to really do a lot with uh, making sure that like electron, uh, you know, kind of things being, our, our waste rather is being uh, reduced. It's also supposed to make sure we're investing in resiliency, that monies are going to frontline communities. It's supposed to make sure that eventually all of our electrical generation, I think in 2030, goes to zero, and then by 2050, we're net neutral, which frankly is not good enough. We need to get there even faster, but we are, you know, we attended the, the meeting, I gave testimony, I think it's gonna be on 
YouTube or Facebook pretty soon, and when it is, we'll post it on uh, the, the account. But I spoke about how you know, part of it is basically they want people to you know, try to use public transportation. And unfortunately, if we're gonna use public transportation, we're gonna, you know, we, we can't be a transit desert pretty much, and we're gonna need to up even the bus when it starts in June, that it can't run every 30 minutes. It's gonna have to run a lot more frequent than that. I spoke about ferry service, I talked about some of the blocks that flood, talked about the Minifert Lagoon, which people here experience every day, uh, and things along that nature. Talked about the inequities of funding with Pelham Bay Park. Talked about the Hutchinson River and the pollution that goes on there. Talked about that we have the Hutchinson River, which you know what, streams downhill, bro, or downstream from there. Uh, we also talked about you know, Rodman's Neck, which we're gonna get to a little later on. And we still have the, the old Pelham Bay landfill. So there's a lot of environmental issues very concentrated right here. We see them because we have to travel these roadways every day and we are trying to address them, but it was, a, it was a start, I guess you would say. And one of the good things is normally, uh, and I know Millie, you've worked in government, a few other people here have too, uh, there's community block development grants which tend to only be skewed, to, well, you know, rightfully skewed and directed at communities that are um, you know, solely based on income, basically, that disadvantaged communities will go first. But now what they're doing with the climate, uh, with the climate uh, council is they're including a variety of different factors. How hot is it there? How vulnerable are you to a storm? How close are you to emergency uh, emergency services if they're needed? And which we're actually dangerously uh, towards the bottom, believe it or not. Uh, and all those things have factored in. So City Island and most of the East Bronx is, are considered a disadvantaged community. And why that's good is that as this council starts to be out funding, we are going to be eligible for that funding. And, you know, we have made it a point when like these public comment periods come up and most people would yawn and forget about it. We actually sit there and we submit the testimony and we get angry and we type things out on the computer. And I, my hope and expectation is that we have uh, represented your anger and uh, things like I mean, that very well. Compliment when we were told by our, our former congresswoman in the office that we sounded very bronx on our letter. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a compliment. That's good. That's right, right? That, that's, that's always a, a, a plus. Um, so that's been good. And as speaking of our, uh, she's still our current congresswoman at the end of the year, yep. is uh, we've written a few letters, so we wanted to bring up to speed about what those are. One of those is. There's a grant opportunity through the Department of Energy, and this would be used to put electrical lines underground. This is part of the bipartisan infrastructure deal. I spoke about this at the last meeting. Our Congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her office has been making sure that we're in consideration for the grant, has been speaking to essential players, who includes the governor's office, because it's gotta come through the, through the state, the mayor's office, our state legislators, Con Edison, which you know, nobody really wants to deal with Con Edison, but here we are dealing with Con Edison, to try to get the utility lines at least in Pelham Bay Park underground. I know at the last meeting, some of you voiced your opinions and your concerns that it should be more broad than that. I respect that, I agree with that, and we are trying, you know, we're trying to move this forward. But if we can get the utility lines underground, on nights like tonight when we get the wind advisory, we'll be a little bit more safe, if you will, uh, which is good. And. Uh, we're also, uh, and I think, I know Barbara's on here also working on this through the Hutchinson River Restoration Project. Save the Sound is applying for a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is for the watershed management plan of the Hutchinson River. Phase one is Westchester, which they've already started. Phase two is the Bronx. And we're gonna be a partner with them on the phase two aspects, along with other environmental groups in the community. It's not just rising, but we are you know, active, we're sending letters, they requested this because they recognize the people who come to these meetings and the people who show up and do a lot of great work in the community, and we appreciate that. And then the third is what we just spoke about earlier. The Waterfront Alliance is gonna be doing some youth programming and we're gonna be supporting that, not just their funding requests, but probably also some operational support as well through volunteer hours. So if you'd like to volunteer, you know, please let us know because we'd love to have people involved in teaching the children about you know, all the important things about resiliency, neighbor, how to preserve our environment. There's so many great different aspects that we really need to get into here. Um, our ferry petition, which as everyone knows, we did have the ferry article, uh, which was the front page of the Bronx Times last week. Uh, we also, if you have, there's um, on our sign-in sheet here, which is going to be going around in a few minutes, there's a little QR code. If, if for whatever reason you haven't signed it, 
which I find hard to believe because I know all you guys and every time I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, you can put your phone up with the QR code and you can sign on it right here electronically. Uh, the good news is we hit, after the Bronx Times article, we hit over a thousand people sign it. And I will share with you the overwhelming amount of those are City Islanders. So that's, think about that, that's like almost 20, a little less than 20% of the neighborhood. So we're going to be furthering that a little bit more, looking into some other aspects to either digitally advertise it, maybe doing some more earned media placement. I'd like for more voices to speak about the ferry, not just me. I think people know I'm in favor of the ferry. I don't think I'm breaking any news with that. But if you are a really strong proponent of the ferry, Kim, I, I think you would be wonderful for things like this. Um, we want to get you out there. We want to make sure that people understand it's a very, very broad-based movement. And you know, sharing some of the arguments that you don't commonly hear. People you know, like to say, what about traffic? Well, what about traffic if this ferry was to run from Orchard Beach to City Island and take how many cars off the road on the weekend? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, how would that impact traffic? What about traffic if you've got to make your commute to Manhattan like my friend here often does, and you could go by ferry rather than um. in the subway or, or sit in your car and, and, and fumes for however many hours. And again, as, we're, as so much of our effort to lower our carbon footprint depends on reducing the amount of uh, you know, combustible engines and, and frankly the cars we have now, investing in things like ferries are going to become way more common and they're going to become way more frequent. And we should get in on the ground now and try to really further that to happen. So again, we're at a thousand signatures. You can share it on your social media. You know, Some of you I, I are social media influencers, I'm sure. And uh, you could get your friends to sign, your neighbors to sign, your your relatives who you like to sign, your relatives you don't like to sign. Think about it this way. If you don't like somebody, you wouldn't have to drive them home anymore to the city. You could put them on the ferry and get them out there, you know? So it provides a lot of opportunities here. Um, these are some issues that came up in the overall discussion at the last meeting. Uh, the manufacturing zones, uh, both on Schofield Street as well as over by Reynolds Street and Pell. Uh, many of you voiced that you thought that they're dangerous, and obviously there's, they're not just emitting fumes and things like that, but they seem to be in a high volume coming in and out when the kids are being dismissed from school. Right. And there's one the school. Crane Company? Mm -hmm. Crane Company and the one on Schofield. On Schofield. So Schofield's really the, the, the trucks coming in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, technically, two times it's are, is at the beginning of school yeah. and at the end of school. And it's on. It's zoned, that's what it's zoned for, but it was zoned for that when they were building ships, not moving cranes, you know, or whatever. And it was also before PS 175, so it was before the manufacturing was directly next door to the public school. So, poor planning on somebody's park and put them together. Um, is, question, is consolidated for sale again? Is that, is that a thing? Or? Uh, you know, they, there's a back and forth with that. We're not really, unfortunately, all that's private sales. They keep it confidential. It's okay. leasing and things like that. I had heard at one point they have a lease on the property. I don't know. I, was just thinking I can look into it. Could we put the ferry there and stuff? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, whatever. I'm sure. Oh, it's what a good idea. Because if have it's for sale, it. yeah. that's what I mean. If it's there, for sale, it's got everything. It's yeah. got everything. Let's um, so, run it down, right idea. Yeah, you know, again, I don't, it, it, the, 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 the availability is hearsay, but if it is for sale, it would logically make sense to put it all there. I've so, heard it's for sale. Yeah. You know, but, again, yeah, you know. Um, so, uh, that's Sorry. great idea. No, great idea. I wrote it down. I appreciate it. It sounds like it would plug one hole. If it's available, it's definitely something we should do. And I just wanted to say the 45th Precinct is, uh, they have met with the owners, as I said last time, all of a sudden all these emails that had went for months about how bad it was are suddenly getting returned. Uh, apparently they told the 45th Precinct, at least the Schofield site, that the tickets from the uh, fumes or from dangerous driving or idling in the middle of the street or idling in the fire zone are just the cost of doing business. So the 45th Precinct has now made it their business to help them further the cost of doing business. And so if you see the police out there, that's why they're out there, because they didn't get a very welcoming or good response from our friends in the uh, manufacturing zones. Um, and you know what? We have our guest of honor here, the 14th borough president for the Bronx, right? Yes. And uh, somebody who will be back to City on, I'm sure, during her tenure many, many more times, Vanessa Gibson. So let's all give her a round of applause.
And I know we're also virtual, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, so right. I look that Facebook way. Okay. Live. <laughs> oh, Facebook Live. Okay. Little Zoom call. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank Good you evening. so much to City Island Rising. Thank you to uh, both David and John and, and really everyone here. Uh, for the wall, we're welcoming you to have your monthly meeting. It's really an honor to be here. I'm in month four as the new Bronx Borough President. I'm number 14, as it has been said, the 14th Bronx Borough President. And I come to this space as a former member of the New York City Council. I represented District 16 for eight years, uh, parts of the West Bronx and Claremont, Claremont Village, Concourse, Concourse Village, High Bridge, Mount Eden, Morris Heights, and Marisania. Uh, and I was very proud to be a member of the New York City Council. I came in to the city council at the time when the administration was turning from Mayor Michael Bloomberg to Mayor Bill de Blasio. So I came in at the same time with about 20 other members. We call ourselves the new cohort of the city council. Uh, at that time, we were new. Now we're like elder statesmen, stateswomen, uh, because that was eight years ago. But it was really a great honor. During that time, I chaired the Committee on Public Safety. I was also the co-chair of the Women's Caucus. There were only 15 women at the time. Now there's a historic 31, uh, which I'm grateful for starting this year. And I also was a deputy leader. I did a number of things. I had two speakers. Um, and we did a lot of stuff at the city council uh, during that time. And even now, as I step out of that position, I'm making sure that as the borough president, I have a voice. I'm working with the city council's delegation, with our delegation chairs, our deputy speaker, Diana Ayala, the new speaker, Adrian Adams, mm -hmm. and certainly our new mayor, Eric Adams, and his administration. And then prior to my time in the city council, I was a member of the New York State Assembly. I served for about four years there, from 2009 until 2013. Uh, and that's really how I got my start as a legislator. I was an intern at the university at Albany. I was getting my bachelor's degree at SUNY, proud to be a SUNY grad. And I learned about an internship at the New York State Assembly during my senior year. And I applied, and I was able to work for an incredible leader from the Bronx, South Bronx, uh, named Aurelia Green. And she was a member of the Assembly for 27 years. And I learned under her leadership. And I often you know, say for many that she was my political mother. She was my political mentor. She gave me so much access as she climbed. She lifted me up. Um, and she planted a seed who is your borough president today. Mm -hmm. So I'm so grateful to Aurelia, many of you that knew her and worked with her over her entire journey. She served for eight years, uh, along with Ruben Diaz as the deputy borough president for his first eight years. And then she said, God called her to stop working and she retired and stopped working. Uh, but unfortunately, she transitioned on May 8th of last year. So it's just been a time. I do miss her. She was a big part of my political career, and when I decided to run for borough president, I knew that I wanted to just not make her proud, but I knew I wanted to carry on her legacy. And I was very grateful that the voters of the Bronx uh, elected me in the Democratic primary in June of last year, and then in November, we won the general election. We took office January 1st, and four months later, here we are. <laughs> what a journey. <laughs> These four months have been extremely challenging. I started my first week at Bronx Borough Hall. I named Janet Figueroa as our deputy borough president, so we are the only borough in the city of New York that's being led by two women out of all five boroughs. And Janet and I are working hard every single day to not only represent the Bronx, but to prioritize what's important to the residents, the families, our shareholders, homeowners, property owners, our businesses, our merchants, faith leaders, clergy, CBOs, not for profits our hospital providers, everyone that lives and works and raises their family here in the Bronx. And I realize when you think about the history of this borough and all of the challenges we've been through, the burnout era, the disinvestment, a lot of underinvestment, a lot of opportunities that were missed and as the borough president, I want to not only take advantage of those missed opportunities, but I want to be creative and innovative in the work we do. We have to make sure that these agencies are operating more efficient. It shouldn't take eight to 12 weeks to get an approval for a stop sign or to get pothole repairs done and street resurfacing. And these are the things that many people complain about all the time. The commercial trucks that park in residential communities and don't get ticketed, 
uh, we have a problem in this city. And remember, we are operating at a reduced workforce because unfortunately, we've lost some of our municipal workforce due to the VAX mandate, but we also have some that are in the process of waiting for the exemption that has not yet been approved. And so some of those workers are over a number of agencies are not necessarily working. Some are, but not everyone is. And so we're at a reduction right now, and Mayor Adams is going to have to either backfill those positions or figure out if there's an opportunity to bring some of those workers back. And I know that's been a question, that's been a concern that's been raised, because we have to make sure that the day-to-day -day operations of this city are better. We have to make sure that garbage is picked up, our parks are clean, sanitation has the support, the parks department, DEP, all of the city agencies that we work with and expect to actually have a service because that's what we pay taxes for. And a lot of these systems in place, sadly, but realistically, are designed to do exactly what they're doing. And I think that's the problem. <laughs> we have to change the system. We have to look at the procurement process, how we award contracts to some of these organizations, how they respond to RFPs, how we award contracts and we hold them to their contractual obligations to fulfill exactly what they're supposed to do. And that can be HPD, it can be HDC, DEP, DDC, DOT, DOE. It's like a whole vocabulary here. These are all city agencies. Uh, do it, DYCD, ACS, everybody. Uh, all these city agencies that have a function. And the mayor has made a lot of appointments. I think about 80% of our city agencies have a new commissioner or an older commissioner that has been rolled over, like Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, who remains as the DICTA uh, commissioner, that's the Department for the Aging, or Anna Bermudez, she remains as probation commissioner. So we have some familiar faces. Lorraine Brillo is the first deputy mayor. Five, all five of the deputy mayors are women. Um, so the mayor's been doing a lot of great things. And now I think over the next several months, because we're now at the 100 day mark, we now expect to see some actual results. The mayor is trying, and you all remember, you know, as city legislators, we only have so much that we can oversee. We can't change criminal procedure law, that state. We can't change tra vehicle and traffic law, BTL, that state. So when it comes to speed limit, when it comes to holding violent drivers accountable when they speed, when they hit people, pedestrians and children and cyclists, those laws come out of Albany uh, where I used to be. And so it's not always easy when the mayor goes to Albany and we advocate, you know, we ask for everything, you know, you wish list, you wish you get everything on the list, but you know that you're going to have to compromise at some point and find some sort of a balance because you're working with the members of the state senate and the state assembly and as well as our legislative leaders. So there is a lot of things that I'm looking forward to doing, but one of the things, of course, hearing from all of you about your priorities here on the island, what we can do working with the community board and other stakeholders, uh, many of our merchants, uh, on the backdrop of COVID, two years, I know that many, many businesses have struggled to keep their doors open, to meet payroll, to just survive and provide a service and maintain their customer base when the price of goods is going up, when just the cost of living is going up, but wages are still stagnant, right? And property taxes are going up and water bills. I mean, I won't even talk about Con Ed, but that's a whole nother conversation. But a lot of these things are really led by authority. But as the board president, we do have a voice. We have relationships with the governor, the assembly speaker, Carl Hasty, majority leader, Andrew Stewart Cousins. We're working with Mayor Adams. We're working with all the administration. I have a lot of meetings coming up with the deputy mayors, HPD, to talk about the blueprint. What does the blueprint for the city of New York look like? You've only seen the mayor announce a few. One on economic development that focuses on workforce development, MWBEs, local hiring, entrepreneurial opportunities, uh, access to technical assistance, access to capital, loans, uh, building generational wealth, right, so that we can maintain legacy businesses here in the Bronx. He's also talked, this is probably the most popular one, um, and also the most controversial one, the blueprint on public safety and what that looks like. And all of you, every time you turn on the news, I mean, I don't have to tell you because you know and you've seen what is happening in the Bronx and across the city of New York with violence, with robberies, with break-ins. I, I, 
can't imagine some of our neighborhoods that are subjected to catalytic converters being stolen out of cars. And that's happening in parts of our borough. And what we're seeing all the time, the horrific shooting in the subway station in Brooklyn and the 29 New Yorkers that are in the hospital now, but the resiliency of New Yorkers stepping up, helping neighbors, people that they don't know, but you're on the train just like I'm on the train, and I need to help you because you can help me too. And, and seeing that in plain view, um, and, and now looking at what the state legislature has done with the adopted budget they just passed on Saturday to see what that looks like in terms of changes on criminal justice, on bail reform, on discovery, on raise the age. All of these are measures that were passed by the legislature in Albany that many people were asking for changes. Prosecutors, district attorneys, as well as NYPD, law enforcement in general, giving law enforcement the tools that they need to support the work, making sure that we have initiatives like Summer All Out, the neighborhood safety teams that have been rolled out, which is the new anti-crime unit. They're called neighborhood safety teams, NSTs, and we're doing them in cohorts. The first cohort, there were nine commands, nine precincts out of the 12 in the Bronx that started in the first cohort, and now in the second cohort, we have other precincts that are also getting NSTs. These NSTs are a sergeant and six officers who work usually at night, like the 6 p.m. to midnight or later or 2 a.m., and their only job and function is to deal with illegal handguns. Getting the supply of these guns under control because most of the guns that we are seeing in our city and in our borough are coming from out of state. They're coming from downstate and it's too easy to get it. Drive up 95, get on the bus, and come right here to the Bronx. And now what you're seeing are this new phenomenon known as ghost guns where the guns don't have a serial number, they're not traceable, and you can go on YouTube and get an easy guide on how to make these ghost guns. And we believe that a ghost gun was used in one of the horrific shootings we had on last Friday that took the life of a 16-year-old high school student that was walking home from school. Um, President Biden made an announcement this week on ghost guns. I'm going to be working with one of our members of Congress in the Bronx, Richie Torres. We're having a press conference tomorrow with Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark. So you'll see that on the news, and we're going to talk about introducing legislation because we know we have to stop these guns in their tracks. The only way that we deal with trafficking is at a federal level. The state can only do but so much. The city can only do but so much. So we need to make sure that our federal legislators are doing something about these guns. The New York delegation is great, but you all understand that we struggle with the U.S. Senate because they are literally 50-50. We are half and half, and Kamala Harris is like the dividing vote. And so to get something done, it is extremely hard to get this legislation passed. And I've met with Majority Leader Schumer, I've met with Senator Gillibrand multiple times to try to get legislation passed. Um, and I also want to recognize, of course, in my first month, first week, uh, we had a horrific fire in the West Bronx in Fordham Heights. And it was an apartment building where a family was using a faulty space heater that uh, unfortunately malfunctioned and caused the entire apartment to erupt in flames and the whole building caught on fire. And many of the residents uh, fell into the stairwell and died of smoke inhalation and other respiratory issues. And it was the businesses and New Yorkers and Bronxites that stood up, that donated graciously, generously to families in need, realizing that it could be any one of us or someone we know, and I'm so grateful. It's been three months, and we're still helping the residents of Twin Parks. And even after that horrific fire on January 9th, we've seen other fires, both residential and commercial. We just had a fire a few days ago. I lose track of the days, and I think it was Monday, I think today's Thursday, and there was a fire in Morris Park uh, on Rhinelander, not too far from Jacoby, and almost 40 families had been displaced. And you wouldn't believe that the alleged, and I'm saying alleged, because there is an investigation, and it's a police matter. We believe a vacant apartment on the sixth floor was being used as a drug den. And that's what caused the fire in this building. And I say that because I need people to be aware and attentive to what is happening. 
If you see activity in buildings and areas that you know seems off, someone needs to call. Because oftentimes when we go in and we look at records, who's calling 311, who's calling HPD, does the Department of Buildings, FDNY know, and some people are not calling. Many are, and the agencies have to respond, but a vacant apartment potentially being used as a drug house is unacceptable. And those actions of those individuals cause an entire building to be displaced. Half of this roof is off right now. And the 40 families that we house Monday night in local hotels, we now have to find apartments for them for the next few weeks. Not days, but weeks. And can you imagine? Thankfully, kids are out of school next week. But when they return back to school, these are children whose lives have been changed by the actions of individuals that didn't have their best interests in mind. And that is happening throughout not just the Bronx, but the city. Illegal activity, being aware of what's happening, uh, lots of things that are going on. So my job as your borough president is to work with you, to strategize with you. I heard as I was coming in to talk about ferry service. Uh, I know that is a priority. Uh, the Gateway Project. I know there are other projects that we're talking about. I know Heart Island is always a conversation. Rodman's Neck, looking at waterfront opportunities and really making sure that we not only enhance the quality of life for residents and families of City Island, but we continue to make sure that this is the hub uh, of just restaurants and retail and businesses, but it has to be done in a responsible way. And I realize that as we talk about new opportunities, that means people, that means traffic, that means noise, more cars, and so I understand that. Everything has to be done with a balance and in a responsible way. Sometimes it's, it's overkill, it's too much, but sometimes it may not be enough. And that's where I rely on all of you to help me find that balance, strike that necessary balance where we address bringing in jobs potentially, we have services, but we don't overburden the community. We don't overburden the services that are already here, the cultural institutions, education, libraries, the businesses, the merchants. We don't overburden a community that is already at the maximum, right? And I recognize that every neighborhood is different. So I am here to listen to all of you to talk about how our office can be supportive. Uh, we have a very busy office, very busy. Uh, we are working on Bronx Week which will be May 5th through May 15th. It is 10 days of all things Bronx. And I'm very excited because we are adding some new flavor in Bronx Week 2022. We're going to have more events around health and wellness. We're going to focus on education. We will be honoring some of our long-standing members of the community board. We're going to honor parents and school safety agents and our law enforcement partners. We're going to honor many young people. We're identifying young people that are on the cusp of graduating this year, going to college in the summertime. Very excited about that. So I will make sure that all of you get our information, our cards, whatever we can do. Healthcare is a very, very big issue for me too. Housing, economic development, and really putting forth a blueprint, not only for City Island, but for the Bronx. My job is to make sure everyone is safe, that you are safe in this community, that you are safe in any community in the Bronx. You have an expectation to be safe. And anytime something happens, I take it very personal. When children are victimized, when our elders cannot walk down the street because they fear that someone's going to attack or mug them, when I think about what happened to the 76-year-old woman in the East Bronx that was robbed and broke her hip, as a result of that, it breaks my heart because that is my grandmother, that's our grandmother. And it was done by a teenager, and that's unacceptable. We have a lot of people that have problems in this borough. I will always be the first to admit that, but I want services for these people. I don't think everyone deserves to be in jail, especially those that are accused of low-level nonviolent crimes. But those who are accused of violent crime, oh yeah, you, I'm sorry, you need to be incarcerated. I'm sorry. And I say that because I have to be the one with these mothers and fathers helping to pay for funerals and doing vigils because their children were gunned down and their only fault was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The 61-year-old grandmother on Crescent and 188 last Monday that was walking down the street about to go into a deli 
and there was a dispute on the other end of the street and she was shot in her back and she died at the hospital. We had to tell that family that their loved one is never coming back again. And, and that's not normal. So I do take it very personal. And I try to be very balanced, but I also know that those that are accused have to go through the system and they must be held accountable for their actions because their actions have taken lives and we don't get a do-over. We don't get to do this over again. We have a problem in our city with handguns that end up in the hands of the wrong people. And yes, we know that there are answers to that with programs and jobs and after school, universal childcare, which was passed in Albany. I'm excited about that. That's going to be a game changer for New Yorkers that are working that can return to work because many of them can't afford childcare. And if I can't afford childcare, I can't go to work. I can't pay my rent and my mortgage. So I realize that's a critical component of our work. So I want to thank all of you. As you guys can see, I love to talk. Um, but I thank you so much for your time. There is a lot going on, so I look forward to working with City Island Rising. And I thank you for the invitation. And I hope, you know, they always say, if they invite you back, that means they like you. So I hope you invite me back. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. We put them on the back if you emailed them beforehand. So we have five questions for you. We'll keep them very quick. And then if people have questions That's in the room. Is really little. I know. I will, I will read them. Okay. And actually, it touches on a lot of the stuff you talked about. In this. Uh, first question. I have a concern about potholes on City on Avenue, especially on Potholes Street in City on Avenue. Can, the Bur can our Bronxboro president help us with getting funds for these repairs? Repairs all capital. <laughs> <laughs> Prepares on capital. Yes, I, yeah. So the answer is yes, our office can help. We do have capital money in our budget every year. Mm -hmm. So the bar president's capital budget comes through the city budget. Mm -hmm. And we got a budget in January. The budget was cut, not happy about that. But the executive budget for the city should be coming out at the end of April. So my hope, I'm praying, it's Holy Thursday, I'm praying that our budget is raised so I have more money. But there are instances where we can work with the Department of Transportation and give them capital money for a pothole repair, for street repair, bridge work. Bridge work is a little more complicated because that's a big capital. But a lot of the repairs that you see, we need to beef up DOT. Honestly, yes. DOT doesn't have enough money. And sometimes when you look at some of the units, do you realize like the pothole repair unit is separate from the unit that does the street markings, is separate from the unit that does the stop signs, is separate from the unit that does the traffic lights? Like they're all over the place. I've never seen anyone like that. And we need to streamline this. Yeah. So we do not have a borough commissioner for DOT just yet. Navarro Lopez, as all of you know, is now working for Governor Hochul. So Keith Cowb is the acting commissioner as of right now until there is a new appointment. So my hope is that we will see a new commissioner and meet with that person. But ultimately, we need to make sure the DOT gets more money in the budget so it can be dedicated to street resurfacing as well as pothole repair. And then the second part of that is the other frustrating. When you call 311 or when you call the community board and you make a request to get repairs done for potholes, it shouldn't take weeks. That's the challenge, and a lot of it is seasonal. I know if it's raining, if it's snowing, of course they cannot do it, but now with the weather being much nicer, spring, summer season, my hope is that we can pick up the pace on these repairs. But yes, we can do that and follow up with the OT. Madam Borough President, mm -hmm. question two. I would really like to know how our Borough President is working with other city, state, and state elected officials, and even Representative Ocasio-Cortez, <laughs> And the, mo uh, and the moment until there is a new district to ensure that noise abatement measures for Rodman's Neck are actually implemented. Right. Um, it's yeah. been so many years, yep. and we've had this promise, and it's always at the end or at the back burner. No one seems to be able to get it done. So how can they all work together to end this farce of broken promises? I will just say, because she's our guest, I can be easy on her, she just literally walked into this problem, so there are people to blame. She is not the person to blame. There are other people to blame, but if you have some ideas, because you know, sure. you used to deal with the city capital budget, so mm -hmm. I know you know this issue very well. Yes, I know Robin's neck very well, and the initial problem that happened is the NYPD had an estimated amount of what the capital would cost to do the entire noise mitigation plan to completely renovate Rodman's neck. Mm -hmm. And you all know that Rodman's neck is not just used by the <coughs> NYPD. DOC uses Rodman's neck, sometimes FDNY, other city agencies. So you know what I said? The NYPD should get money from those agencies too. Mm -hmm. 
Because if other agencies use Rodman's Neck for their training, for their recruits, then this should be a joint effort. So the bid that came in was highly over the amount of the budget that NYP initially had. I mean, I'm talking anywhere from 300 to $350 million is the total, total, total cost. The, the design of Rodman's Neck and what it would actually look like, most designs, if you think about a park or library, a design will take anywhere from six to nine months. This design took two years, and it was two years pre-pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, of course, everything was held up. And then we also had some other capital projects. We also had the 116th precinct out in Queens. We have the new 40 precinct that is coming to the South Bronx. That's like the only brand new precinct we're getting, as well as capital for some of the other precincts in the Bronx. We have 12 commands, two housing, and two transit. Um, and so I have to find out, since I did leave the council, you know, they don't always give me updates, but I will inquire and find out where we are with Rodman's Net if we're fully funded. But that is something that I know is super important. And so I commit to you that I will not only follow up on where we are, but I think it will be great at your next meeting if we could actually get someone from NYPD to come and do a presentation to the residents and stakeholders of City Island to talk about Rodman's Neck. Um, but again, I do think other agencies, this is my opinion, um, I have not yet met with the mayor about priorities for the borough because we do have some. Uh, obviously, Metro North expansion, uh, looking at what's happening in Hunts Point, the Kingsbridge Armory, NYC Ferry Service expansion, and what that looks like. So there are some big ticket items, I call them, where it's going to require not just city and state, but I also think the important part of this, who's gonna be the new Congress member? Is it still AOC? It, well, this area's gonna be here for it. Be in oh, you're gonna be the new district. Yeah. Complicated. Okay, yes. we wanna have the five members of Congress. Yeah, okay, not, I got it. That. Even though we're in litigation, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, so hopefully we... That's a whole nother story. So, yes. yeah. so the, the district lines are being challenged too. Okay, this is a lot going on, everyone. Um, but. I really also believe in order for us to get Rodman's Net up and running, we need some federal dollars. We need members of Congress to give, get us some money through the Build Back Better Act, our infrastructure, whatever it is. Senator Schum is great. He got us $500 million for Metro North and the access to Penn Station. So it's not impossible. I think if we make the argument and we support it, we just have to see it through, right? We can't let it fall, so you have to bring elected officials to the table, get commitments, and make sure that they follow through on money because these are infrastructure projects that matter and you know they take a while. So even as we talk now in 2022, these projects won't happen for another few years. So that's really, really important. So I will get the update from NYPD and make sure that they can come and do a presentation. And, and just a side note, we do have some people watching online. Uh, what is it, it's April 24th, right? That's when the executive budget comes out? That's a tentative date. That's a tentative date, so she knows this stuff. Yeah. That is the date when you hear the executive budget comes out. Open it, it's gonna be thousands of pages. Mm -hmm. Control find Rodman's neck. There's supposed to be $220 million this year in that budget. That's what de Blasio promised on his way out the door. We've been here before, we've heard this music. But that's what was supposed to be promised, so we're gonna be checking on that. Okay. And I'll, so. I'll follow up on Thank that. You. So what initially, what John is saying, the 220 million that was committed by the previous mayor has to be reappropriated by Mayor Adams. And that's absolutely possible. We do that all the time. We also do outer year designations. So let's say it's a five year plan. So we can designate money in year one, year three, and year five, outer years. And that money will remain in the budget. It won't leave. The only time that money is gone is if you reappropriate it elsewhere. So I can check on the 220 million. Third, I'm sorry, along with that too, with Robin's neck, there's also an issue with the water quality, and there's no transparency. The water quality now. Well, yeah. because of whether or not there's lead poisoning or anything that's happening, yeah. there is no transparency. Like we're trying to try to find out, we're trying to get your test done, and we're not. Yeah. Okay. We need to bring everybody. I appreciate. We will reach out yes. to you. Uh, state uh, state legislators to a brief time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just yes, like you're, we, you're very fortunate to have Nancy. Yes, right? Nancy. Just like to say that. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> what, I just want to check. That's all I do. Um, now, question three. Uh, my question and concern is environmental. The Bronx, as far as I know, has only one compost site at Hunts Point. Composting pickup has so far been suspended as far as I can find it online. 
Given that climate change is such a critical problem, I would like to ask that this issue be addressed and composting be encouraged in all boroughs of the city. Drop-off sites should be more accessible, and local pickup <coughs> sanitation should be reinstated. Agreed. Okay, there we yeah. go. So that's also a budget issue, and the Department of Sanitation does run the compost program, and I do know that in the Bronx, I'm on a high end, maybe two community boards, yeah. maybe two, um, and we have 12. So we have to have a conversation with DSNY. I do know that there's a shift. James Grayson, who's the current city commissioner, is going to be retiring, and there will be a new commissioner coming in. Um, I know that because I know who the person is, but it's still embargoed until the appointment. But the person has experience in the city, and I really think will be good for us. Um, and then I also think with some of these agencies like sanitation, we need to have borough operations. And yes, we have a borough operation. We have different uh, districts in the Bronx under sanitation, but we don't actually have a commissioner. We don't have someone championing sanitation issues. Composting is very popular, and the only reason why you see it where it is now is because three budgets ago, when we were hit with COVID, we had to make drastic cuts. And composting got cut, recycling got cut, DSNY got cut, parks got cut, NYPD got cut, and now, three years later, we're starting to put some of that money back in. So I can find out where we are since we're still between prelim and exec to see if that is a priority. And also, it could have been in the, um, what is it called? The city council response. Okay, great. I get mine. No, no. Coming from the assembly and council, I, get, I was about to say one house. <laughs> Not one house. So we have, um, this is actually a pretty short uh, question. Will the annual Tour de Bronx bus Right, uh, bike ride continue. It's usually sponsored by the Bronx Tourism Council. Yes, the answer is yes. There we go. Tour de Bronx is in October, and we're already talking about it. Olga Tirado runs our Bronx Tourism Council, and we are going over all of our events for the year, and we will have Tour de Bronx. The last couple of years, it was minimized because we didn't have a lot of sponsors. It was COVID. But this year, 2022, we want to get back to full reinstatement. So be on the lookout. We're already working on sponsorships. Yeah. So we'll be able to advertise probably in early summer for Tour de Bronx. Awesome. Mm -hmm. This question, look, uh, some people, that they're swinging for the fences and God bless them okay. for it. Can we have the dog park, ferry stop, and an urgent care? <laughs> <laughs> this was one person's question. Wait, that's not an or question, that's uh, a tan. Yes, it's so, a dog park, ferry stop, which I think you addressed the ferry, and, and an urgent care. Yeah. In that order. So, in that order? Wait. In that order, you put down the land. You're going to guess, so we're going to tell you that. So, <laughs> here's the thing. This is a community that is active, that has residents and homeowners that care, property owners. Anything is possible, I say. So the things that we need in mind, if you think about a door park, we need an actual space, we need a park. We need open space to actually create a door park. So if it's just an actual door park just for our animals, or if it's an existing park that we are going to create like a dog run, mm -hmm. right? So that's two questions there. Do we want a brand new park or can we use an existing park? So that's what we have to ask ourselves. And then the parks department will come up with an estimate if it's the parks property, and then we just have to get the funding. The council members have funding, borough presidents have funding, our members of Congress are now getting money, which is great. Um, ferry stop, that's NYC Ferry Service. And I know that there have been some concerns, I've heard good and bad, both sides I've heard. Some of the businesses I know see it as an economic revenue, as bringing in more customer base. But remember, ferry stops take up a lot of space. Not only do we need the actual ferry to come in, but we also have parking and we have the no, deck. Don't. Um, you don't need parking. Oh, we, oh, okay. The whole idea for the ferry is, is alternative not transportation. Okay. And the ferry is supposed to limit cars and, and the, sorry, I don't mean to get so. No, no, I understand. <laughs> That's just what I've seen in all the examples. Yeah. Right, but, but, but you can't have people using alternative transportation if and everything is concerned about cost. So, right. a, a nice thing, because I, I, right. I think you're both right. A nice thing that I think we need to flesh this out a little bit more. And but also, a drum roll to our next meeting, our guests are going to be the people from the Waterfront Alliance who are kind of spearing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of the ferry yeah, stuff. So we're really going to drill down on this issue, and for the people watching online, because we do have some detractors who watch online. Or build a, or build a parking lot. But, I mean, there's, well, there's, there's, there's space, space there's, there's space for that, but we can... 
I, I'm really hoping to use the next meeting because you're right, there is not, I think, I think people do want, I think there's a generational divide, but I think there is a consensus yeah. behind it. I do think that we're gonna be able to work through the Waterfront Alliance to try to bring in some of those people who might have some good faith concerns, and not everyone does, but some do, and try to see how we address those things. And you're right, Dan, that you know, there's spaces down there on some of these shipyards, the Consolidated was a great point, where maybe those could turn into parking. That those could be parking for the ferry, possibly. Orchard Beach is yeah, one. We well, about that. I think you could do both. I mean, ideally, really, if you could do both, people could get take the ferry from Orchard Beach to City Island to clear a lot of cars off the road. Yeah. But it's your answer. Your no, no, I mean, the question is not me. I'm sorry. No. And you know, and I was saying that just from experience of when we started the site at, at Soundview uh, with the ferry service and then Ferry Point Park, and then we've also opened new sites in, in um, Southern Brooklyn by Coney Island. So all of the examples I've seen have always had parking accommodations, but that doesn't mean it's a mandate. So um, I appreciate you raising that. Question. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I came off so harsh. It's just the first oh, no, thing. Right. But like, for example, I've had words. I did the, <laughs> I did the, you know, I did the Brooklyn flea market for forever, uh -huh. and we were in Williamsburg when they put the ferry in. Okay. And what happens? There's no parking there. Everybody gets off the ferry, and there's money in their hand, and they spend money on the community, <laughs> and it happens. And it, and and I saw it firsthand. So it's like you can't. You can't not do things in places because there's no parking because mm -hmm. the whole idea is the world is bigger than cars, yeah. right? And we're trying to figure out how to transition into more economical and environmental ways to do things. Yep, Thanks. I agree. No, no, I appreciate, I, that. I appreciate that. I just think it's tough because in many of our communities, you have people that do drive cars and they always say to me, if the subways are not safe, I'm not getting on. Uh, they don't like to ride bikes. They don't necessarily walk. And I think it's really about what communities want, but it's also about expanding the, your mindset of looking at different modes of, of, of alternative uh, transportation. Right. So, yeah, that's Absolutely. all it is. Thank you. As far as urgent care, yes. I think we should identify a space mm -hmm. and what type of provider. Uh, urgent care is all over city MD, mm -hmm. AFC, uh, there's Essen, there's many. Many of them are so, Monty. They're and, FQHCs, they're Article 28s. So when I got this question, I, there was a, um, an AFC in the okay. general area, a uh, husband-wife team, husband's a doctor, wife's a nurse. They actually wanted to open one out here that would be primary care and urgent care. What? What is AFC? AFC is just the American That's Family the Care. Oh, yeah, it's right. just the name of it. Um, but they were actually really interested in the, like this would be like their retirement project. They would come out here, they would do like a 12-hour urgent primary care hybrid, and they were they were out here a few times, I had lunch with them. I reached out to them today because I saw this question, and they were, you know, things have been kind of in a pause state with it. Uh, they're celebrating uh, Passover, so they couldn't be here, but they, they want to talk about it next week. So next month, for the person who has the urgent care question, we're gonna work with our president, and we're gonna get back to you on that. Okay, and yes, then, if there's an appetite, I yeah. think primary care, yeah. And, and looking at you know what a AFC and all the others do, they provide a myriad of services. And if you have that right here on the island, you don't have to worry about traveling. And it can be with a provider that you know that has relationships in the Bronx. So I work closely with Essen Healthcare. They have 30 different healthcare centers all over the Bronx. And obviously I work with AFC. They have a number of uh, healthcare centers. And what we're now also seeing are an expansion of school-based health clinics. So Montefiore runs a number of school-based health clinics in public schools, sometimes campuses, sometimes a standalone school, and they provide primary care. They have full-time doctors and nurses and clinicians and psychiatrists, and they also provide dental and vision services too, for free for students. And a lot of it, again, it's all subsidized. If we have schools that are interested, they reach out to us, we send Monty out, they do an assessment, they look at the space, we retrofit it, and we really put the money in DOE, School Construction Authority, and usually a Monty or Morris Heights or Children's Aid Society run them, but they're really popular and you know, something to consider. And uh, okay, I have something to say on that, but I'm not gonna say it now because I don't wanna waste your time. This is the time for people to ask for president questions, not me, so I'm gonna just, who is the question they wanna ask? Roy does, uh, so Steve's hand was up, Patrick, and you, my friend, Nancy. Okay, so we'll do it in that order. Roy first, Steve, Patrick, Nancy, and then, go ahead. Yes. Okay, so I wanna talk about ferries, and um, I, I beg the indulgence of my neighbors that I'm not gonna talk specifically about the City Island Ferry, but I wanna talk about the uh, Ferry Point Ferry, which okay. is the newest stop that opened in 
December, January, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so like as, as Dan pointed out, um, one of the things that makes a service like the ferry work is, is the connectivity to it. Yeah. Um, if, if people aren't going to drive, then they need to get there by bus, or they need to get there by subway, or they need to get there by bike, or they need to get there, and now we're getting around to the real point of this, by scooter. Um, so there's this big scooter project in the East Bronx, which in June is going to be expanded to the southern half of the East Bronx. And um, I was at a community board 10 meeting yesterday evening um, and discovered that scooters will not be allowed to go to the ferry terminal. And the reason is because the ferry terminal is on Parks Department property. You did this very entertaining liturgy before of all the different city agencies um, <laughs> and how they don't talk to each other, and that's exactly what we've got here. Um, so apparently, Parks does not want the scooters to be in the park. DOT, which is running or overseeing yeah, the pilot the project, right? um, is amenable to the idea that the scooters would go all the way down to the ferry dock but they need to negotiate with Parks. Um, it doesn't sound like Parks is too keen an idea, so hopefully we could get some pressure at a higher level that would talk to DOT and talk to Parks and say, you guys really need to work together and make this happen. What about a narrow, narrow carve out just for that specific space, right? Like you're not open, you don't have to open it up. Yeah, I agree with you, right? You, you don't have to open it up that all, scoo uh, all Parks allow scooters, but just in that one particular instance, it makes sense. So you can allow like a narrow. I, I would be happy with that. But the, the other. I didn't know that. Yes, you are correct. Um, okay. And okay. The, the other half of, of that problem is um, I, I don't know who did the construction project. It may have been parks, but they built this beautiful waterfront thing that's connecting the Frog's Neck neighborhood, like Harding Avenue, over. Uh, along the shoreline, almost to the ferry dock. Oh, yes. yes, almost to the ferry oh, dock, because good. there was a span of about a hundred yes. feet that belongs to the New York State DOT, oh, I believe. Different agency. Yes. <laughs> Another agency, and they have this little thief them, and they are apparently saying, "No, you cannot <laughs> go through our Ring road parking road. lot." So, yeah. yeah, these are all these are all the sorts of things that make a a transportation system work, which is that you can get to it by assortments of different things from wherever you are. So hopefully we could get some pressure on, on all these various agencies in the city and the state to sort of talk to each other and make this happen. Thank you, Roy. Okay. I think we all probably agree that. Okay, um, second was Steve, and then Patrick, and then, no, no, sorry, yeah, Steve, Patrick, Nancy. That's right, okay. okay. Um, Madam Borough President first, thank you for coming out. Uh, really appreciate having you here. Um, I also, like the gentleman who preceded me, when you were speaking about the agencies and the structures we have that, you know, we, we have this big apparatus, but it doesn't always seem to work. You know, it mm -hmm. just seems to sometimes want, uh, want to uh, maintain the status quo. Right. Um, one of those things that um, you mentioned later in your uh, remarks was the community boards. And the question I had about the community boards is, um, are there any efforts being made to uh, reform and update them? And the reason I ask is, um, this community two year, just under two years ago uh, had a really tremendous gathering um, down by the bridge. Um, it was a, uh, a protest in memory of George Floyd. And yeah, it was a Black Lives Matter action that we, we organized. And you know, uh, it was really tremendous. We had over 150 people came out. Um, it was a, just an incredible day. And this community has been at the forefront of really trying to be as inclusive, uh, you know, and, and progressive thinking as we can. Um, and it's been challenging, you know, you have to meet people where they're at. Uh, the reason I raise this is there are members on the community board who do not have inclusive points of view. Um, they are, you know, okay, so you, you kind of know what I'm alluding to. Can I'm you say that a little louder? <laughs> sure, one more time. There are members of the community board who do not have inclusive points of view. They are not uh, uh, welcoming towards people who are different from their own, you know, from themselves and their own experiences. And um, so the question I'm asking is, uh, as the uh, borough president, I believe, my, my understanding is, you have the ability to kind of bring in some fresh blood. 
<laughs> and um, we have people in this community who sit on the community board who have, who have made some really kind of problematic remarks. And I think it's time for some new blood. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. That's a great point. And when we look at the community boards, remember the 59 all over mm -hmm. New York City, sure. but as well we have here in the Bronx, our office makes the uh, recommendations for 50% of all of the members on each community board, mm -hmm. and maximum, obviously, 50 members. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that when I first got to office and during the application process, guess where we were recruiting in high schools? Because the age high school teacher. The so. community board is 16. Yeah. So we were reaching out to high school campuses and getting young people involved because we do want to make sure that community boards are reflective of the community. Uh, whether you have different professions, you have different people that bring something different to the table. And it doesn't take away the seasoned members, right? I'm not trying to say that some of the older members don't necessarily get it. Many of them do. I'm just trying to say that we have to rebrand the community board because what I often encounter is when we come to making decisions on projects, the community board goes in one direction and then we go in another direction. Yes. And it's just simply because we just don't believe the decision that was made by the community board is in the, the best interest right. of the whole community. Right. And then I have people that complain to me all the time and say, well, the community board doesn't represent everyone and the same people go to the meetings every single month. How can we recruit new members? How can we get people to attend meetings, the general board meetings, and join. And then the other thing I think, which is a larger conversation outside of just the Bronx CBs, is we need to give the community boards more money. We do. They need more resources to hire certified planners when we go through Euler to give them the support system. And I won't even get into technology because some community boards just aren't <laughs> ready to do remote meetings, to have online meetings, their websites are not updated, no social media <laughs> presence, my goodness. And we've seen that in some community boards do a great job, and then others do a not so great job. So we are working, uh, we actually are in the midst of reappointments now. We received 500, about 515 applications to join the community board. And we are meeting, you know, in addition to my 50%, we have to work with all the members of the city council. So that's sometimes a challenge because, you know, it gets very political, you know that. Um, but my goal is to do as much as I can at a borough level, but also I think it's also working with the city council too. Just one thing I would add real quick uh, mm -hmm. to your earlier point about getting high school students. I'm a, I'm a social studies teacher at Lehman High School, and uh, if you need recommendations, I would be uh, okay. more than happy. Okay. I have some tremendous students. Student government? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Some really great kids yeah, who would be a uh, welcome addition, I think. To they might even bring some maturity to some of these kids. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and we do have some youth on community boards, and I will tell you, the only reason that they're leaving is because they're going to college. That's a good reason. But that's a good reason. Yeah. So we're honoring them. Some of our outgoing youth members on the community board, we're honoring them for Bronx Week as they leave for college and all these things. Patrick. Yeah. Thank you. Something really short. Um, okay, just really because we got other people. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I have a uh, application pending with the oh, board and, oh, you do. and uh, <laughs> hopefully your office will uh, look favorably <laughs> upon it. That, that was a good second. I, I gotta give him that. That was a good that second. Was a good Pat, Patrick, your turn, sir. Hello. Hi. Once again, thank you for joining us in this incredibly hot room. I just took off my jacket. I'm going crazy here. <laughs> But anyway, so I'm the most recent member of a group of people, the three scientists that are very concerned about the Hutchinson River, which has really been running like an open sewer for like at least 20 years. There's barbecue. Probably longer. Yeah. So we are hoping that we can lean on you or go to you and your office, and we have two senators who are following us as well, who would like to have support from you, because that's part of your learning too. Are you willing to contribute your help? So I would, can we have a meeting? And so I can understand with the senators. And I also think it's important, you know, Nancy from my office mentioned, you know, there is a great synergy with myself and the County of Westchester. I have a great relationship with the mayor of Mount Vernon, Sean Patterson Howard, and I have a great relationship with the Westchester County legislator uh, and the executive, George Latimer. He's a good friend, he used to be an assembly member with me. Um, I also am good friends with the mayor of Yonkers, Mike Spano. So I know, you know, because they're right next door to us and there's a lot that happens, a lot of transportation hubs that connect 
County of Bronx to the County of Westchester. So I would love to make sure that they can be involved too because I think we also need to look at grants. We need to look at NYSERDA and uh, DEC and you know Empire State Development. We need to access this money. There are millions of dollars out there that we don't tap into because oftentimes we don't know. So our non-for-profits can apply for this money so that we can start accessing. So I would love to talk about that. Well, you know, that's what I draw Senator I said, I said Dr. Senator Gillibrand and uh, Biagi are taking us down that road as well. And also we're trying to build relationships with you know, other people like Save the Sound, mm -hmm. and the yeah. Bronx River yeah. Alliance. Yep, so we're, we're all a common Bronx goal, you know? yeah. So we'd yeah. love to have you. Okay, sure, us. definitely. Is that okay if I no, ask two questions? That's up to the, to the guest of honor. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> but she's been Thank very you. good about indulging us. So. Okay, the first one is Orchard Beach. Some There's been a wealthy donor, this was under Bill de Blasio, and they're building a maintenance building up on a hill where there are trees. It doesn't make sense to, that area of the park, is full of deer, turkeys, wildlife. It doesn't make sense to do more construction. It makes more sense to renovate the beautiful buildings that are around the promenade and renovate the maintenance building that we now have rather than build a new one and tear something else down. So that's one question. Okay. The other question is something that nobody likes to talk about, which is human trafficking. Oh. Okay. Which is a billion dollar business. Yes. Um, Westchester County here in New York City, here on City Island, the party boats. Um, it goes under the radar because the majority of the buyers are married men with children. Um, a police officer finds a 35 year old man having sex in the backseat of his car with a 14 year old girl. He comes, he takes them out. The man says, look officer, I have a wife and kids. He walks. The child goes to jail, she's 14. No one, very few people go into prostitution as a business. It is, they are trafficked. Mm -hmm. Whether they're, whatever the financial level, they're trafficked. There's the pimp, and there's the John. What we need to do is decriminalize the prostitute. And some of them are male. We need to decriminalize that person. But prosecute the Johns, mm -hmm. the pimps, the madams, um, the sellers. But this, but nobody talks about it. We have it here on City Line too. Uh, and if we don't talk about it, Nothing gets done. That's, That's no. Nope. Thank you, Nancy. Um, that is a very important topic. I do a lot of work on not only domestic violence, gender-based violence. I have a task force in my office, and I work with all the different organizations from Safe Horizon, Sanctuary for Families, the Family Justice Centers, Set to Year Two, Day One, Her Justice. Legal Aid, Legal Action, these are all organizations that work in a cohort, and their job is to help, not just the victim, but also the families that are impacted. And right now, there are two bills in the State Senate and yes, State I Assembly. Know you know that. about the bills? Yes, I know. <laughs> but there's one that we need to pass and the other one we don't. We so don't. you're talking about the full decrim versus we the Nordic don't model? We want the full decrim. You want the Nordic model? Yes, the, yeah. the okay. equality the model. model. Okay. The Swedish model. That's the, the one that model. Was cool. yeah. they call it. Okay. Yes. They call it the Swedish model? Well, they the do Nordic. it in Sweden, but it's the equality mm -hmm. model. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. And we also have an organization in the Bronx. It was led by a woman named um, <coughs> Q English, and it's called Not On My Watch. Reverend English now works for President Biden, but it's now being led by a woman named Pamela Damon. Okay. And she runs Not On My Watch, and all they do is human trafficking. It is something that is really under the radar, yes. and sometimes you would never believe the young girls, and sometimes boys that are trafficked, yes. that are brought here yes. to the Bronx, that are used as sex workers against their will, they're used physically and emotionally, 
And then sometimes, can you imagine coming forward and going to the police and being double victimized and have to tell your story over and over and over again? It is traumatizing, it's dehumanizing. And it's something that we want to continue to work on. So I am supporting, I, I've seen both bills and I've heard both for the Nordic model as well as for a full decrim. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard both. And, and let me just answer the question about the Parks Department. So I love the Parks Department. But one thing they struggle with is capital. So I believe, because I know what we're trying to do with Orchard Beach, there are three different phases of the Orchard Beach reconstruction. The pavilion is number one. There's about $100 million that we've raised, and they're going to start construction at the end of this year. It is so much easier for the Parks Department and most agencies to demolish and rebuild. When they renovate existing buildings, it is a nightmare. It's double the price, and it's usually delayed in time. And I say that because I experienced that with the Bronx Children's Museum. We have not yet opened the Children's Museum. It was delayed, 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 and it's a Parks Department building. And it's only the second floor. And now, finally, five years later, we're opening it in June of this year. But and I think it would have been better. We, we should have demolished and rebuilt. But in the, the same place. In the same they place. Do that? Yeah, they can do that in the same place, absolutely. They don't have to do it in a different No, no. Place. There's nothing that says we yeah. have to do it in a different space, no. Mm -mm. Only unless they like remediation, environmental work, but that can be addressed too. I think it's the goal of what the agency wants, but also what the community wants too. So if you're asking me to look into that, I can. <laughs> And you look into so you said the maintenance building, right? Yes. And it's yes. Beach. Yeah. At, but as to human trafficking, foster care is also a funnel. I mean, I can tell you an example of a person I met years ago. In the 80s, she was beaten into a coma by her stepfather when she was seven years old. He was in NYPD. She was in the coma for two weeks. He was covered by his buddies. Her mother stayed with him. And she was put into foster care, and she was trafficked. So, mm -hmm. I met her in the state house. Um, Linda, and then is that you? I know you might have to run to another thing. Do you have time? Do you want no, to more? No. Okay. I'm not going to no more meetings. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. So we'll do Linda. That's does anyone else have a last question? Okay, Dan. That's what I need to do. Okay, <laughs> so we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, and then Dan, and then <laughs> people are nice enough to bring wine, so it's, you know, we'll have, we'll be more leisurely after that for everybody who's here. So, uh, Dan, I'm sorry, Linda, oh, Linda. Friend, Linda. Well, I just want to thank you for coming, coming back, because I know you were here doing your campaign, yes. and uh, so many important topics, and I don't want to spend them, you've had a long day. I just wanted to also remind everybody here who, so many of us are very, uh, keyed in on uh, taking the city-owned property that's at the entrance to City Island. Mm -hmm. It is now being misused by a squatter. DOT acknowledged that that user had no right to use the city property, and it's really prime waterfront space, and it's so visible onto City Island. And if we're asking people to uh, uh, treat our island right, the most important thing we can do is when people come onto the island, not see a junkyard, mm -hmm. because Agreed. that's what it is right now. Yeah. And it's city property. Mm -hmm. And the, the sad it's thing is, city. is that it's DOT controlled, mm -hmm. and DOT has said they don't need it. Uh, Con Ed is gonna come through this year and build a gas line, and Con Ed has said, as long as we have access to our line, anybody can yeah, use it. And, but what we've had is a real problem of having DOT follow through on what they need to do on their land. And DOB, <laughs> all these acronyms, yeah, the Department of Buildings um, uh, uh, issue the violations for misuse of the property, the oh. privately owned part. Oh. So because it's not being used in accordance with zoning. If we can get the two agencies to work together and DOT to define its site, we can make progress on this. We've been working on it for years and that we can use the property in line with the New York City waterfront plan to create access to the waterfront and really get people connected to the waterfront we don't have enough city uh, city owned property to, so that the people who live here they can't access the water and use it uh, kids can't get to the waterfront and really learn about their ecology so 
that's one of the goals we have with that property. And uh, I'm going to send we the Gateway Board. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an office property board here. It's going to write a letter to the new commissioners and really ask them to have their agencies work together and really get this done. But I would like to copy you. Oh yes, and make sure that you're involved. In sure. And if you you know like us to meet with anybody on your staff okay. and give them a fuller picture of the issue. Oh, really it's been ten years because DOT never wanted to do what it needed to do, New which is take control of its property. It's it's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Linda's done a lot of good work on this, and she's absolutely there's there's something, and I don't know what it is, but actually a little bit off my conversation. It's I think a new era. Point, we have a new mayor. Yes. We have new, new representatives. Borough new borough president. We're yeah. going to make progress. Yes. I hope it's exactly. a new opportunity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't have 10 years. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. 10 years, you'll be the mayor. It That's can be done in six months yeah. if you really want to. I don't have 10 years. <laughs> six months no, if you wanted to. I you know, agree yeah. with you very I much. I refuse. No, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. And I feel, just kind of touching on, and then we're going to go right to Dan, but touching on what Dan was saying earlier, that some people, the Gateway is a wonderful project. It's something that needs to get done. It's something that, if anyone's front yard looked like the Gateway project did, the city, the city would be all. It's like a knife. It's like the city would be all over these people. But you, you deal with, unfortunately, you know, a few very vocal people who they use traffic as an excuse to do anything that's positive, moving the neighborhood forward. And like, we can't take City Island and put it in a time capsule. The oxygen will run out and everyone will die. Like these people need to recognize that, and as a result, we've got to sometimes be more forward thinking and open to new possibilities, and that's really what the Gateway is about. And people, you know, Linda's great, and I think people need to listen more to you, among other people. The and whole I think, board. The yeah. whole board is made up of uh, community yeah. organizations. Everybody has a voice and a stake in it. Yeah. So. And, and people need to stand strong and, you know, stand up to certain yeah. other folks. Uh, Dan, <laughs> go ahead. Just, um, I'll keep it brief. Um, so food insecurity is obviously a major issue in the yes, Bronx. Yes, Considerably less on City Island, but still an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there was there used to be funding um, for a lot of the food distribution. The Fred program. What's that? Oh, the, the, the Pink Fred program. Right. Yeah, for the city, yeah. Which, yeah. which fed, you cool. know, tons and tons of mm -hmm. people. And Adams recently cut the budget for that, so um, as far as I understand, all it's a proposal. Um, Not final. Well, there was there. There's no more. There was being there was right food now. distributed. Yes, yeah, because there's no more money. Right. And that would have to be reallocated in the new budget. Okay. That's fine. so. I guess from uh, experience of distributing that food to now not having that food to be distributed at all, right. at all, and empty fridges all over New York City, um, if you could potentially put pressure on people to continue that funding so that the community fridges and the mutual aids have fun, have food to go around to the people who, okay. you know, because it, 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 in theory it was a COVID issue, but we all know it's beyond COVID, right? Yeah. People have and the issue still exists. People, what's that? The Even issue more still exists. The, the, yeah, the, the issue existed beforehand and COVID brought it to the light. Um, so if, I don't know who, I don't exactly know how logistics work, but if you could encourage the funding okay. to that, because there are hungry people and it, it would be really helpful. Okay. I'll reach out to the mayor's office of food policy. Kate McKenzie is the director. So she oversaw that <coughs> program as well as the Get Food NYC program. That was the program that did home delivered meals um, as well as opened up 400 school buildings for food for individuals and families. And a lot of that was city money that we spent, but the federal government reimbursed us. They didn't even reimburse us 100%, which is a whole nother question. <laughs> But there were there was like there was like a mosque in the Bronx that used to do a yes. distribution and literally overnight Lots like there were lines of people to get the food to distribute yeah. the food and no food there. Yeah. So, uh, but in the interim, I think I mentioned to you the last time we saw each other that we can contact Food Bank, City mm -hmm. Harvest, okay. these are organizations. So the only challenge is you may not get weekly food yeah. for like six months, but you can get a series of maybe a couple of deliveries. Um, and if you want to work with the private sector, I can connect you with Goya. Uh -oh. Goya is great. I mean, like if it's food for people, like three hundred thousand pounds of food to Catholic charities. All right, let's, let's have let's have a discussion. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I look into. I want to. I want to ask everyone to join me. I think the bar president's been a great guest, and he's a great guest. Stay, but you've been on your feet for like the better part of 90 minutes, and, and I feel you. Um, I we had an agenda. We're gonna break in two minutes. 
I want to thank everyone for coming out here. There is one important announcement that needs to be made before we all break. Uh, Barbara? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, like, but we, we, there is going to be, again, City Island votes. Everyone knows that. We vote at a higher propensity than other neighborhoods. That's why we get paid attention to, even though we're a smaller neighborhood. And there is an educational effort. And Barbara, why don't you take All right. So City Island Individuals is having a candidates night next Thursday, a week from today, right? At the Yeah, next Thursday. Mm -hmm. two, two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Oh, yeah, two weeks. Sorry. No, that's so, fine. Oh. On the same oh. issue <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, I hear it. I just. The, the candidates well, running for yeah. state, um, <coughs> for Bianchi's position, state Senate. Thank you. So please come. Mm -hmm. Anyone who, no, it's, no, I think it's, oh, wait, I can read the, it's at 7 o'clock, but if you want to help set up, you can come at 6.30 and help set it up, Grace Church, next two weeks from tonight. All the, I have some flowers here. All the Democratic candidates who are on the ballot will be there. They've all agreed. So it's not one candidate over another. It's going to be just like the, the Klein Biagi form. It's going to be the exact same thing. We have the same moderator. Barbara and I are going to be involved in it. It's going to be really good. So that was the last announcement. If people want to stay, we have some line. We'll answer questions. Uh, but we're going to close out. I want to thank Michael, because Michael's been recording this whole thing by hand. And that's not easy. <laughs> Are there any questions we need to answer there or not? All right, everybody, thank you and good night. Oh, and thanks to David Ellis for having us once again. Yes. All right, let's